All right, well, welcome to the uh, focal talk on the Jehovah Witnesses and Mormons. We're starting with Jehovah's Witnesses. And uh, here, again, I'm going to, in 20 minutes, I'm going to give you as much of an overview of the Jehovah Witnesses as a cult of Christianity as I possibly can. Uh, these lectures are actually built on my general lecture about uh, what is a cult or the essentials of cults that I did earlier. So to jump right to it, it is this, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society is the technical name of the group, but they're more commonly known as Jehovah's Witnesses. And they are a, as we say, theological cult of Christianity, uh, just for the reason because they perfectly fit the definition of a theological cult of Christianity, which is a cult of Christianity is a group of people that claim to be Christian, but that group, which is led by an individual leader, group of leaders, or the organization itself, their leaders deny either explicitly or implicitly one or more of the essential doctrines of the Christian faith found in the Bible. So cults are, in effect, groups of heretics. Uh, they are groups that still claim to be affiliated with Christianity, but they would deny one or more of the defining doctrines of Christianity. And in the general lecture, when I talked about this, the phenomenon of cults is virtually unique to Christianity because it's only within Christianity that we have groups that claim to be Christian but not deny essential doctrine. Where in other religions, world religions like Hinduism or Islam or Judaism uh, and so forth, you never find a group that says I'm a Muslim, but then would deny that Allah is the true God or deny that Muhammad is the prophet. So it's only in Christianity where we find these things. So that said, let's get right to its, the application of this definition in the Jehovah Witnesses. First, the idea of essential Christian doctrine is just that. It's the essence. It's that which makes Christianity what it is. So that's the focus, not secondary doctrines. Uh, or non-fundamentals, which are things like church government, where real Christians can disagree on that, but you're probably not going to do that in the local church. Uh, you're not going to have an Episcopalian and a congregational form of church government in the same church at the same time. Uh, so there are some things we do disagree on, but you can't do it in the local church, but we can still be Christian and disagree on them. Uh, there's a third level of doctrine we call adiaphora, or indifferent things, which Christians, even in the same local church or setting, can disagree on those things, like what's the best way to do spiritual warfare. And uh, on those, you know, we, we, it's not going to divide even a local church on that, but uh, again, there's still a right and wrong way to do it, so there are differences of opinion. So that said, focusing on the essential doctrines, where do the Jehovah Witnesses reject essential Christian doctrine? And the key here is that first and foremost, it rejects the authority of the Bible. Now, what is odd about the cult of Christianity is, you know, for example, the Jehovah Witnesses are never going to say we reject the authority of the Bible, but what they do is they retranslate the Bible, which means that they're not drawing from the scripture as what it actually says, but they purposely retranslate the Bible to fit their theology. For example, in their New World Translation, instead of with John 1.1, says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, they, they reject the deity of Christ as because they're Arian and anti-Trinitarian. So they, in their minds, they fixed that verse, and they translate it as the Word was a God rather than the Word was God. Or in John 8, 58, where Jesus claims to be the I Am, they fix that verse and translate it that Jesus now says that he's the I have been rather than the I am, claiming to be the Yahweh, speaking to Moses from the burning bush in the Old Testament. So the fact is, while they say they affirm the authority of the scripture, remember the definition can be that they implicitly reject it, which means that by their very actions, it's implied they reject the authority of scripture or some other doctrine. So, so that's number one. Number two, they reject the Trinity. The Trinity is a defining doctrine of Christianity. And it is unique to Christianity, but yet the Jehovah Witnesses have always been anti-Trinitarian. And remember, that's different from just being non-Trinitarian. You know, a Hindu is non-Trinitarian, but a Jehovah's Witness and other of these cults of Christianity and classic heresies, they think that the Trinity is either pagan or illogical. So they just don't think we're wrong. 
they think that we're pagans because we must have three gods. So in that sense, what they're rejecting that tenet of Christianity. Now, to deal with that, of course, the underlying presumption in almost all anti-Trinitarianism is that they don't understand how three can be one, so it's illogical, or somehow that you know, if three can't be one, so uh, you know, pagans had a notion of God as three and one, Trinitarians have a notion of God as three and one, so Trinitarians must be pagans too. Uh, of course, two ways to deal with both those objections. You might note that uh, pagans have a notion of God as a creator, Jehovah Witnesses have a notion of God as creator, therefore Jehovah Witnesses must be pagans. Okay? So their own logic, you can turn back on them. They'll say, well, that's not right. We're not pagans. Yeah, well, then stop using that against Trinitarians. You know, uh, pagans have teeth. We have teeth. That doesn't mean we're pagans. All right? It's an irrelevant similarity. To the logic issue, the problem is, is that how can three be one? Well, number one, that's actually fairly easy to explain once you study a, a bit of metaphysics and uh, ontology and know how to make distinctions. But let's just broaden the question on how to talk to any anti-Trinitarian who makes that claim. And what you'd say, for example, is that, well, forget three persons who are the one God for now in the discussion. Let, let's make it even more base that we all actually agree on. Does God have more than one attribute? Yes. So, okay, well, let's say God has 30 attributes that we could enumerate. Uh, everything from infinity to aseity to omnipresence. Uh, well, how is Jehovah 30 in one? That he's 30 infinite attributes, yet he's only one God. They can't explain that either. So, you know, are you going to disbelieve in Jehovah now because you can't understand that he's 30 in one? See, so the, the reasons that they reject Trinitarianism uh, are simply invalid, and you can show that by a couple of very basic arguments uh, that fit that. So, uh, they're Aryan in their Christology, point number three. Uh, Aryan there, note it's spelled with an I, not a Y. Uh, Aryans with a Y, those are the white supremacists. Uh, Aryans with an I, they were fourth century heretics that rejected the deity of Christ and said he was a cr very powerful created spirit who became incarnate. The modern equivalent of that that the Jehovah Witnesses hold is that they believe that Jesus was Michael the Archangel, the first and greatest creation of God, who then became a man. So, uh, so again, so rejecting the deity of Christ, rejecting the Trinity, uh, that's, uh, again, it's part and parcel for the Jehovah's Witnesses. Of course, they don't like the idea of Christ as a God-man, but they, uh, they can't understand how he's an angel-man. They have no explanation for that. See, supposedly it's illogical that God can become a man. Well, how does an angel become a man? So, again, they have the same problems, but that's why we're not in a cult, right? We actually thought through this, and we see that those are bad arguments, and we don't join these things. Uh, and then every other area, they, they reject the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Christ didn't die for their sins to save them. Uh, it makes salvation possible that Jesus ransomed his body but they're going to have to 100% by their works work till the end of their mortal days to make it into Jehovah's paradise on earth. So it's salvation by works. And then they claim Christ was uh, put to death in the flesh but raised as an invisible spirit creature. They deny the bodily resurrection of Christ, yet Paul says if Christ is not risen, our faith is empty, we're still in our sins. So that said, we could go on and, and give you a few more, but this is why they're a cult of Christianity. Not only do they claim to be Christian, but almost every cult of Christianity claims to be the only true Christian church on the face of the earth. Jehovah Witnesses claim that they are Jehovah's only true organization on the earth. Uh, Mormons claim that there's only, there are only two churches, the Church of the Lamb and the Church of the Devil. And guess what? The Mormon Church is the Church of the Lamb. And guess what we're in? Right, the Church of the Devil. So. So they make these exclusivistic claims. Now to move on, so besides the fact that they're not Christian, it's just falsely Christian in almost every area, uh, one area you want to focus on with the Jehovah's Witnesses are the fact that they, um, they're false prophets. They are Adventist in the, in the sense that they are looking closely for the second advent of Christ and they make uh, a lot of effort to try and study biblical prophecy, but they've made 
about a half a dozen false prophecies of the second coming of Christ. Uh, Deuteronomy 18, 20 through 22, uh, God says that a prophet has to have a 100% record. Uh, that if the prophet speaks in the name of the Lord and the thing doesn't come true, he says, don't fear him. He, he's spoken it falsely. He's not a prophet of God. Uh, so here, Jehovah Witnesses predicted the end of the world for 1914, 1916, 1918, 1925, 1941, and 1975. Those are the dates they predicted for the end of the world. They all came. They all went. Hence, the organization itself, which they claim Jehovah Guides, is a false prophet, and we have no business listening to them because they clearly have spoken falsely in the name of the Lord. Now, to move on a little bit as far as some of the particulars about Jehovah's Witnesses, um, I already mentioned their New World Translation, and this was a problem for them because they didn't have their own Bible up until 1950. And prior to that, they were using the King James and a couple other versions, but they'd always have to try and correct it. Uh, why? Because they rejected the deity of Christ. They rejected the idea that you could have salvation now. So, like I said, they changed the Bible to fit their theology where, you know, a God uh, in John 8, 58, Jesus is now the great has been. He's the great I have been instead of the great I am. Uh, Colossians 1.16, uh, why is that significant when... They, tra they translate it by means of him, all other things were created, because biblically, Yahweh, or as they call him, Jehovah, is the creator, and, and only the creator is Yahweh. So whoever made the heavens and the earth is God, according to the Old Testament. Isaiah 44, 24 said, Yahweh stretched out the heavens by himself and laid out the earth all alone. Why is that significant? Because there are at least three places in the New Testament that says Jesus is our creator. And that makes him Yahweh. That's an act of God. John 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And he was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being by him, and apart from him nothing has come into being that has come into being. He's the creator. Hebrews 1, through him he made the world. Jesus is the, the creator of the world. And Colossians 1 where it says, of course, it says in the, in the real Bible, it says all things were created by him and for him. But Jehovah's Witnesses had to get out of him being the ultimate creator, so they just added the word other in the translation. So it's probably the most corrupt translation that you can get now uh, that's out there, the New World Translation. Now, uh, there are a number of other verses we could go through, but you know, uh, Paul tells us, right, there is therefore now, no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Well, Jehovah Witnesses don't believe that, that you can know right now that you're not condemned. So they take that word now out of their translation, even though it's right there in the Greek text. So this is the way that the, the Watchtower dishonestly translates the Bible and, and presents things. So, so you have to be cautious in using any of their sources because, frankly, they, they're dishonest in the way they're presented. So that said... I'll move on to page two of the handout. Uh, see, I mentioned essential Christian doctrine before and secondary and third level kinds of doctrines. Now, that's the way we as Christians, as evangelical Bible-believing Christians, should approach doctrine. They're, they're defining those things that make Christianity Christian. There's secondary, there's third level. But almost every cult that you're going to find, they have no such tier of first, second, third, level kind of doctrine. For them, everything is an essential issue. You can't disagree on any doctrine that that group teaches and still remain in the group. So for example, for us, it, does it really matter whether you say Jehovah or Yahweh in the church or just translate it in the Old Testament if you have an English Bible? The name Yahweh in Hebrew actually gets translated Lord in all caps. And that's part of a tradition that we carry over from the Hebrew Bible. Uh, but technically, the name is Yahweh. That's the covenant name. But for us, that's an, in one sense, it's an indifferent issue. We know that's the covenant name. But for the Jehovah Witnesses, is a, again, whose leaders have no formal training in Greek and Hebrew and these other areas, uh, they decided very early on, and that's why they're called Jehovah's Witnesses, that they have restored the divine name. Okay? Now, just a couple of minutes on this, because how does this fit this three levels of doctrine issue? Because 
See, if you refute any part of Jehovah's Witnesses and they believe it, they're going to have to leave the Jehovah's Witnesses. So this is why sometimes you can focus on what we would think is a third level kind of teaching, but for them it's essential. They can't deny the name Jehovah and still be a Jehovah's Witness. So I've given you a little blurb here you know, on, on how the name arose in Hebrew. And uh, a couple of items here. First, Jehovah isn't even a Hebrew word. Okay, It's actually the combination of two Hebrew words. Uh, it's the vowels from Adonai, which is you know, master or lord, and it's the consonants from Yahweh. Uh, and then they put those two together, and it would look like something like Yehovah. It's not even a real Hebrew word. The question is, why do they do that? And because in the Hebrew Bible, and again, you'd know this if you took a couple of weeks of first-year Hebrew, that this is what they do in the, uh, with the text, is that for certain things that there's the kathib, that which is the text, the, the written text itself, but there's certain things that they say you should say in place of the written text. So that which is written versus the kare, that which should be spoken in place of the written text. Some of those have to do with updated pronouns, but the biggest one is the name of God, because in, in Jewish tradition, of course, to, to apply Leviticus 24, it says, the one who blasphemes the name of Yahweh shall surely be put to death. So what do, you know, so the, the Jews made it a practice not even to utter the name of God. So how do you, when you're reading the Old Testament and the name Yahweh appears 6,000 times in the Old Testament, how do you remember each and every time not to say Yahweh? And they devised that rather than putting the, the, the kare or that which should be spoken in a footnote, they actually did a, a clever thing for them. They, they put the vowels from Adonai, which is master or lord, which is what you were supposed to say in place of Yahweh. They put the vowels for that on the consonants for Yahweh. And they came up with a, if you read it as a Hebrew reader, it wouldn't even make sense. Yehovah, that's not even a Hebrew word, but it reminds you of this kathib kare say Adonai in place of Yahweh. Now, for someone who isn't trained in Hebrew, you know, somebody who you know, picks up their Bible in the back room one day or reads something and goes, aha, I've discovered God's true name. No, you didn't. You didn't discover anything. Uh, this, would be, this would be the equivalent, okay? Let's say all of us here as Christians, we decided that the name Jesus was just too sacred to pronounce and we didn't want to blaspheme the name of Jesus. So we decided we're going to put the, instead of saying Jesus, when we read the text, we have to say Messiah in place of Jesus. So in the English-speaking world, see, so what we do is take the consonants for Jesus, right? You know, it's J-E-S-U-S, so we take the consonants from that. But strip the vowels out, put the vowels from Messiah in there. And you come up with a word that looks something like edgesauce. If you take the vowels from Messiah and put on the consonants for Jesus. Now, you're an English, is that even an English word? No. But see, if you knew in this tradition that we were supposed to say Messiah instead of Jesus, you would recognize edusos as that combination of two words and know what was going on. But see, but, but now fast forward, you know, a thousand years, someone pulls out our Bible and say, hey, look, we found the real name of Jesus. His real name was edusos. And then they start a cult called Edgesos as Witnesses, right? Uh, so, yeah, this is, a, this is the problem of the ignorance of people who start cults. They think they've discovered something new or discovered something secret uh, that, you know, obviously the Vatican or Billy Graham or somebody has been keeping secret from us. But they didn't discover anything new at all. Uh, all they've done uh, was just uh, not recognize something as simple as that which is written versus that which is spoken. So uh, with a couple of seconds left here, I, I think we're almost done. Uh, yeah, one minute left, okay. Um, majoring in the minors, we've got those couple of issues on the bottom there. The bottom line is Jehovah Witnesses just strive to be different than anything. If, if, you know, if a Trinitarian has a birthday, we're not gonna have birthdays. So some key you know, defining things about Jehovah Witnesses, they don't celebrate birthdays or holidays. Uh, they don't take blood transfusions. And of course for them, the, uh, instead of saying Jesus was crucified on a cross, they even have to be different there. That No, no, he was impaled on a torture stake. There, there was no cross beam, it was just an upright pole. 
Now for us, what difference does it make? It's the death of Christ that saves us. It's the death of Christ that is the ground of our salvation. But for them, it's just a desire to be different, to be new, to be novel, uh, and to be separate, to be unique. So, and again, you know, the, the refutations of this are, are, are pretty clear. Birthdays, there's good evidence that in the book of Job, chapter 1, when he had a feast, each on their own days, that was Job celebrating their kids' birthdays, and Job was identified as righteous. And the biggest birthday in the Bible is what? Jesus' birthday. The angels of God celebrated, the shepherds celebrated. Uh, so birthdays are celebrated. There's nothing inherently evil about birthdays. Blood transfusions, Jehovah Witnesses say that's eating blood. That has nothing to do with eating blood. Uh, or the torture stake, you know, while that's indifferent to us, uh, Christ talks about, or and uh, the apostles, in the Gospel of John, Thomas says, I'm not going to believe till I see the nails, plural, through his hands. So Jehovah Witnesses have one nail going through hands overstretched over his head. So again, the, the, the tradition of a T-shaped or tau-shaped cross, I mean, there's just overwhelming evidence that that's probably the kind of cross that was used to crucify Jesus. Okay, that's two questions. The first question was uh, elaborate on the 144,000 and secondly, why they don't accept blood transfusions. The 144,000, uh, of course, in, in the book of Revelation, uh, at the end of it, it mentions 144,000, 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes. And Jehovah's Witnesses are part of sort of, it's a theological trend that they call remnant theology. Uh, the idea that we're the few real believers who are left. And based on their apocalyptic and at Adventist leanings, Say they're looking to see, well, we must be living in the last days, and there's only a remnant of really believing ones left, and that's 144,000. So the Jehovah Witnesses actually originally identified themselves as the 144,000 living in the last days. Uh, but the problem was, after multiple failed false prophecies, by the year 1935, their membership got larger than 144,000 members. So at that point, they changed their doctrine from saying we are the 144,000 to say, well, Jehovah just gave us some clarity on this. Instead of saying we're dead wrong, we should just quit while we're ahead. I uh, said Jehovah gave us some clarity. And uh, so now we have, well, we have the great crowd class, which are those who will live forever in paradise on earth. And then the ones who actually came to the Jehovah Witnesses prior the first 144,000 are the ones who were actually born again, have a heavenly hope, and then they have God's impersonal active force, aka the Holy Spirit. So you have this little flock which go to heaven, and then you have the rest of the, the, the Jehovah Witnesses that have sort of a lesser kind of salvation who only are uh, uh, live in paradise on earth. Now the interesting part is, is that according to the Jehovah Witnesses at that time, only the ones who were part of the 144,000 could govern the organization. Well, if you just count down the numbers, uh, the last one made it in about 1935. There aren't that many of the 144,000 left. So uh, they're, they're pretty much going to run out of people to run the organization in a couple of years. And that's when they'll come up with a new doctrine. Uh, secondarily, you asked about blood transfusions. Again, their desire to be different. They look... they. They're always trying to come up with ways to do, they do very poorly in medical ethics. And so what they looked at is the book of Acts, where, of course, they had the Jerusalem Council, one of the things they forbade eating blood. Now, that whole context of eating blood, that was a pagan practice of imbibing this. And a blood transfusion is not putting it through your digestive system. It's not a pagan, you know, sacrificial rite. So, but again, they, they misinterpret that to say that you can't have a blood transfusion. Of course, they also used to be against vaccinations and all other things. Unfortunately, uh, too many Jehovah Witnesses end up dying of these phony theological interpretations. And after a couple of generations, they say, okay, we lift our ban on vaccinations. Or, so eventually, they're probably going to lift their ban on blood transfusions. Uh, but there are a lot of Jehovah Witnesses who die, because they, but they could have been saved by a simple blood transfusion. The question is, if I, if I get your question, is, is that... Um, is that they translate the Bible and that helps them with their doctrine. But, but see, the, remembering that they didn't start with the Bible and then do their doctrine. See, they didn't say, let's do an honest translation and then let's figure out what our doctrine is. 
they had their doctrinal conclusions and then translated the Bible according to their doctrinal conclusions. And the, the fact that anyone who actually really knows Greek and Hebrew, look at all the translations that they do and they're just specious, they're dishonest. There is no basis whatsoever. Uh, it's only if you rip the passage out of context you can possibly translate it that way. Like in the Colossians 1, where it, they translate all other things were created by him and for him. The word other is not in the Greek text at all, period. And that there, there are a couple of perfectly good Greek words that Paul uses in other plays that mean other, like alos or heteros or something like that, which if Paul wanted to say other, he could have said other. But uh, he didn't. Same thing with there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. That, as they say, contemporary adverb of time, noon, in Greek, it means now. There, there's just no way you could take that out of the translation. That's why every honest translation says now there's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. So as you go through their uh, translations one by one, there's just no good scholarship that can support it. Uh, John 8.58, uh, when they translated I have been, uh, ego a me, which is a present indicative of the verb to be there, um, it, that's a me, but it makes it emphatic by putting the, the, the pronoun there with an ego, which is not normative in Greek. You just say a me to say I am. So it, it stands out by the fact they put the pronoun there, but when you translate it I have been, now it's a, it's, it's a perfect passive grammatically from a present active Nobody translates that way. I mean, to go from any language from a present, you look for the present in the other language. You don't make it a perfect, I have been. So it's literally, they made, in fact, in their original edition of the New World Translation, the 1950 edition, the footnote on the bottom of John 8, 58, it said uh, a lot of blah, blah language, and they say, after the aorist infinitive clause, it's properly rendered in the perfect and definite tense. Okay. That's the 1950 edition. Now, it, to, it, it, unless you're a grammarian, you wouldn't know what the, you know what the problems with that is. The biggest problem is, is one, you don't render a present tense in a perfect tense, but the other problem is when they say the perfect indefinite tense, there's no such tense in the Greek language. That's number one. And then two, indefiniteness or definite has to do with nouns, not verbs. They just didn't even know enough grammar where they conflated a noun and a verb. So they didn't even know what they were saying in the passage. So, but they put it as a footnote. Now, subsequently, they, they don't put that footnote there anymore. But that's the problem with the dishonest Jehovah Witness scholarship. People who really know the languages can look at that immediately and see the dishonest scholarship. But to the average layman out there, it appears to be scholarly. So this is why you know, the only thing that you can do is you know, resource yourself. Uh, there's, a, there's one good book out there, there's a lot of good books, but there's one particularly that addresses the, all the errors of the Watchtower translation. What's the best way to try to evangelize a Jehovah's Witness? Yeah, yeah. And, and in my Cult of America class that I do at Biola, we spend actually a good several hours you know, training people in uh, evangelism method and how to do this. Uh, but the reality is with the Jehovah's Witness is as with any group that you want to try and talk to, you first find your points of compatibility. Uh, don't start off with disagreement because then it's just a debate and nobody's listening. So what you want to do is start off with, well, what do we actually affirm with the Jehovah Witnesses? And because they really don't have any good scholarship like the evangelical community has, I, I've actually had Jehovah Witnesses in my door multiple times taking notes that I'm lecturing them at the door on intelligent design uh, because they are staunch creationists and anti-evolutionists but they don't have a lot of good intellectual ammunition to support it. So, you know, I, they're sitting at my door, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, intelligent design theory and uh, irreducible complexity and things like that. And see, now for them, all of a sudden, see, they, they, they've lowered their guard a little bit because now I'm an ally rather than, than an adversary because we agree on some of these important issues. Uh, so, uh, you know, the idea that, um, uh, what I usually try and do is play one cult off the other is, you know, if they come, I say, what do you guys think of the Mormons? Because they actually, you know, they teach their billions of guns. And, yeah, that's pagan. Yeah, we agree. That's pagan, you know. Uh, that, that, that's pretty bad stuff. And, um, so 
So what you find is your points of agreement. And I usually like to start with the doctrine of creation. Uh, but then, you know, part of the problem is, is that it's, it's really a misnomer in the sense that they're well-trained, because they're really not well-trained in the sense that they understand the Bible well. They're well-trained in the sense they've memorized a lot of Jehovah Witness propaganda. But you'll find that almost every Jehovah Witness you talk to, they've memorized the same stuff. They're not independently thinking. And that's why what you have to do is get them off their script. Uh, if you ever gone to, if any of you ever gone to Disneyland, you know, if you're if you're gone to Disneyland, there's a ride there called the Jungle Boat. All right, and the guy who ride does the Jungle Boat ride literally he spits out this script through the whole ride. He's memorized it so well he can literally have a conversation out one side of his mouth and spit the script out the other side of his mouth simultaneously because it's just on autopilot. Uh, and that's why for Jehovah Witnesses, one of the ways to begin to try to talk to them is don't talk about the nor initially don't talk about the normal things that they're used to with evangelicals don't start with the trinity or the deity of christ see what i'll do is and i've collected a lot of their resources over the year but you know what i'll do is i start with the name jehovah and i ask them i said now how did you guys come up with the name jehovah and you know I, I went through the analysis here i said you know i only have two problems with the name jehovah and they say well what's that I go, well, the consonants and the vowels. And uh, what? I, and I said, yeah. And I grabbed my Hebrew text and I say, look at this. I say, you realize that the name Jehovah is a conflation of these two things. That's not really a name. They never really studied that stuff before. And so instead of going straight into anti -trinit you know, the Trinitarianism, you know, remember, if they can't believe in the name Jehovah, if you leave the Jehovah Witnesses, you're annihilated, period. If, if you don't believe it anymore, you're annihilated. You, you won't live forever in Jehovah's paradise on earth. So starting at the bottom, so to speak, with what we think would be adiaphora, you get up on some of their arguments on which they're not, not as well supported uh, or they're not as well versed in doing on, on the lower ends and deal with the name Jehovah. So I, I start there and go to some of the other issues, but there are also some... Part of it is we just have to be trained theologically uh, in every other way. And, um, doing what's called polemical theology is you're basically attacking and refuting another system. And the way to, to best do polemic is to always look for the foundational beliefs on which the other beliefs are based. Okay, And I'll talk about that when we get to Mormonism. But for example, remember what Jehovah Witnesses do and this is important, you know, they'll, they'll raise 30 or 40 verses that supposedly show that Christ is not God, okay? Now we can spend hours and hours and hours trying to go back and forth on the, what does this verse really mean, or what does that verse really mean? And that's important, but unless you deal with their presumptions and their arguments, you're never gonna get anywhere. So for example, what they will raise with us is that all of the verses that allegedly teach that Christ is not God, fall into two categories, okay? And that is that those that teach limitation or those that teach subordination, okay? So now for us, it's just a non-issue, why? Because Christ is not only divine, he's divine and human. So what would we expect to find in the Bible statements uh, about him? What, what kind of statements? We'd expect to find statements that say, he is God, he's the creator, he upholds the universe by the word of his power. Oh, and by the way, we do find those, that he's the great I am. And we also find passages that say he had to sleep, he had to eat, he was tired. Now why? Because he had two natures. He had a divine nature and a human nature. So for us, it's important to show, because for the, in their thinking, if I show limitation, it necessarily you know, follows that he's not God. If I show subordination, it necessarily follows that he's not God, okay? So, so what you're gonna do is take out the necessarily part of their argument. It doesn't necessarily follow or entail, if you show this, that this follows. So, and here's why. Uh, you can use a couple of analogies like this. Um, it just ask him, do you really believe that? You think it necessarily follows that if, if, you, if you show this limitation here, he's not God? How so? 
and they'll fumble around for a reason. And then you'll get to the punchline, which is this, let's say, look, uh, let's say you show subordination, okay, that somebody is under authority, all right? Um, and just ask them, do, do you have a mother and a father? Yes. Do you have a boss at work? Yeah. Okay, eventually you're gonna find some other human that's in a position of authority over them. So that makes you non-human, right, or less than human, because you have someone who is an authority over you. No, of course not, right. See, because you're functionally under someone's authority, and you could, classic Trinitarianism says, yes, the son is sent by the father. Uh, the father is the head of the Godhead, but that doesn't make the son less than God any more than it makes a private in the army less human than the general, or it makes children less human than their parents. See, just being under authority doesn't make you less in your nature or being, necessarily. It just, it, it's, it's absurd to even say that. So, so you focus on that, so then every passage they raise that shows how Jesus is praying to the Father, subordinate to the Father, it doesn't necessarily mean by nature he can't be God. Or it just entails that since he's God and man, of course, according to his humanity, he has a human nature. He's born of a woman, born under the law. So his humanity would be, by definition, under the law. But So either way, it doesn't necessarily follow that he can't be God. So the other limitation, well, that doesn't prove that you know, he's not God, because if you think about this, um, we expect to find passages where he has limitations. Why? Because he's God and man. Because, you know, a human nature has limitations, but a divine nature doesn't. And a way to argue that would be this. When was the last time your soul chewed up a hamburger? You can work with me on this. Say, never, okay? Why? Because souls don't have the powers or properties to be able to chew cheeseburgers, all right? They have no causal powers to do that. Souls can think, they can deliberate, they can feel, but they can't chew cheeseburgers, right? Okay, now, but bodies can chew cheeseburgers, all right? But you might note that, you know, in, in, in Christian theology, bodies don't think, souls think, okay? The body without the spirit is dead. The body without a spirit is a corpse. A brain doesn't do any thinking on its own. It has to have a soul or a mind attached to it to think. So this is why, see, the, the reasoning of the Jehovah Witnesses is that well, if you have one kind of substance, you can't have another kind of substance. Really? So if he has a human nature, he can't have a divine nature. Therefore, it follows, if you have a body, you can't have a soul. Aha, I saw you eating a cheeseburger, therefore you don't have a soul. How does it follow that because you have one substance that has one set of causal powers and one set of properties, necessarily entail you can't have a second substance with its own distinct causal powers and properties, and those two can be united in one person. The fact is they are, and we can think and choose simultaneously, yet we're only a, we have a single sense of self-awareness. That's human nature. So, so for us, it's just not a problem, and if you use that explanation, you can show that Jehovah Witness reasoning is flawed. And of course, we've had 2,000 years of reflection on how Christ is a God-man. Jehovah's Witnesses haven't thought for two minutes on how Christ is an angel-man. See, how come Christ in his human nature didn't remember everything he knew as Michael the Archangel? How come he couldn't do everything he could when he was Michael the Archangel? He could create the heaven and the earth. Did Michael the Archangel get tired? No. Well, how come Jesus was tired? See, they have the same problem in the Jehovah's Witnesses. So that's why you want to use those kinds of arguments to undercut their foundation. And then once you've done that, there's no verse they can raise that says it necessarily follows that he's not God. Now, if you go to my website, and I'll give you the, uh, the website address, I have a handout on the Doctrine of the Trinity and some other things like that, which gives you some of these uh, counter-arguments and, and ways to present these doctrines clearly and concisely.